Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the Adult Sunday School lesson for September the 10th, 2023. It's another Old Testament lesson, this time from the book of Ezekiel. It's entitled, Turn from Wicked Ways. Wonderful lesson. This is part of a unit that's called Turning and Returning. It's emphasizing the word turn, which uh, has various contexts. Actually, it's one way of saying to repent, to turn from what you're doing and go in a different way. These prophetic books of the Bible that we're studying for this unit uh, give us spiritual GPS instructions on where should we should be uh, placing ourselves as we seek to follow the Lord and minister. This global positioning system helps us in the modern world to navigate and the prophetic the prophets of old helped uh, children of the faith in days of old to do the same thing last week we looked at jeremiah's urge to turn towards healing today we're with ezekiel who is admonishing us to turn from wicked ways next week turn to compassion from the book of Psalms, and then the last lesson in this unit from the wonderful book of Jonah, perhaps my favorite Old Testament prophet, Turn and Live. The word for turn or turn around is a common verb in the Hebrew Bible, and uh, it has a context associated with it of repentance. It's not quite a New Testament concept of repentance, not, not exactly the same brand of repentance, but it has to do with modifying what we're doing and getting more attuned to God. It seems that God gives God's people GPS directions for living. So no matter where we are, we can turn and return to God. And no matter where we are, we should be doing that, whether we are faithful or unfaithful. It's the same remedy. We need to seek out God while God may be found. Return is the key word for this unit. It's featured in all four lessons. I've looked it up from my study aid that I acquired recently. 50 Hebrew words every Christian should know. There it is. That's the word for turn in Hebrew. It goes from right to left, and that letter that looks like a funny W, that I think is an SH sound, and you put those letters together and it's shuv, and it means to return, repent, turn back, restore, make whole again, and it's actually uh, a word picture for repentance, to stop going one way and Turn about and go in the opposite direction. Shuv. That's what we are being admonished to do in all four of these lessons. Bit of uh, background information about Ezekiel. The main point in the book of Ezekiel, the prophecy of Ezekiel, is that God is going to allow invaders to conquer the Jewish nation, destroying the cities, including Jerusalem, the capital of Judaism, exiling citizens, but in time, God will restore Israel. It's just, it's going to be a long time. Most of the book is a first-person narrative by Ezekiel, but there are a few third-person insertions not written by Ezekiel, but for the most part, it, it's by this this prophet, who is a, a somewhat of a contemporary of Jeremiah, he, he serves the same purpose of Jeremiah in uh, preaching repentance because of the coming doom, but he was a bit younger, a bit younger than Jeremiah. Ezekiel is a weird and wonderful book. Some of the scenes are horrifying and even beyond comprehension. I put this uh, hilarious, humorous note on here that it's, should be rated PG-30. I say that because some of the ancient rabbis 
forbid uh, people who were under the age 30 from reading the book. It's got such uh, morbid and uh, strange scenes depicted that only an adult mind could uh, get the proper sense from them. Ezekiel is famous for at least three famous visions. One is a, a vision of the valley of dry bones coming to life. You know, we sing about the song, uh, these bones going to rise again, my ankle bone connected to the leg bone and all that. This comes from Ezekiel, has a vision of this great valley where all uh, those who have died in the faith and are now scattered, whose bones are scattered, are going to come together and be united again. There's also a vision in Ezekiel of four strange creatures, four in one. One unity, but four different manifestations. Chari I mean, pulling the chariot of God uh, as a way for God to get from one location to the other. Quite, quite an amazing picture. And there's another one of... Uh, Wheel in the middle of the wheel, uh, some type of a gyroscope in modern terminology or the gyroscope of God or some have called it, maybe he was dealing with an unidentified flying object. But these are just three of the uh, uh, strange visions that, that are in the book of Ezekiel and nowhere else. These wildly bizarre images spawned diverse interpretations, both in the Jewish tradition and in Christian tradition. As I said before, the Jewish rabbis banned the book for anyone under the age of 30 because of some rather risque scenes, which uh, is not a subject for today, in addition to bizarre scenes. And even Christian apologists look at Ezekiel in... in uh, in, in quite a, a uh, profound way, they have taken the four creatures that are pulling the chariot of God and uh, said that these are symbolic of the four evangelists. So in the New Testament faith, the stained glass windows in many old cathedrals show four creatures that represent the four evangelists. I have a slide on this a bit later. So... Ezekiel is rich with background and tradition, in addition to a straightforward call to repentance. Here's a picture of Ezekiel as seen by Michelangelo in the Sistine Chapel around 1500. Seems to be uh, an old man in this picture, but he was a bit younger than Jeremiah. Ezekiel is a Hebrew prophet, one of the four major prophets, the major prophets being Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel. They're called major because they're long. They're many chapters long, 50, 60, 45 chapters long, as opposed to the minor prophets, the 12, who are, are three or four chapters long, short chapters Ezekiel is a little different in that he's also a priest. He's a prophet priest in exile in Babylon, which means now he has nothing to do because there's no Jewish temple in Babylon. So he doesn't have any priestly duties to perform. There's no temple, but God gives him a new message to proclaim a truth to those who are willing to listen. God gives Ezekiel this new job, prophet to the exiles, with this message. More woe is going to befall Israel. See, the people, the children were led into exile in waves. Uh, they didn't all, uh, they weren't all taken to Babylon at one time. So some of the upper crust, rich, elite uh, class, they were among the first to go, so they're there in Babylon. But there are many others that are going to be taken to Babylon as more and more cities fall. And the message that uh, Jeremiah, I mean Ezekiel is proclaiming is that uh, Jerusalem's going to fall, 
more woe is coming, so we need to prepare and even repent so that we don't bring about this increased suffering. But there is a, a note of optimism in Ezekiel in that God will eventually rebuild the nation. It will just probably probably be after uh, our time is gone, after our generation. So it, it's a hard message, but it has a tinge of, of uh, optimism associated with those down the line if we can ever return to following Yahweh. We need to get off our path of destruction and return to uh, the basic holiness that is a part of the covenant with Yahweh. So that's Ezekiel. Now, as far as our lesson today, we're, we're jumping in with uh, Ezekiel chapter 33. And so the background information for, for this portion of Ezekiel is that some of Ezekiel's hearers mistakenly thought that it was too late to repent. You know, and you can see how they would feel that way. They're being punished. They've lost their lands and wealth. They've been uh, exiled to Babylon. So they are experiencing firsthand the penalty for corruption and abuse and failing to follow Yahweh or be pr protected by Yahweh. So they feel well, the gates are already closed. Whatever brought us here has is, is happened, and there's nothing I can do about it. I mean, I'm concerned. I don't like it if some of our brethren and others uh, are going to face the same things I am, but it's really too late for me. But Ezekiel reveals something subtle about God's character in that he's not like humans who hold a grudge and, and can never get over it. Ezekiel says that with God, it's never too late to go back. That's a comforting thought. Many Israelites are in Babylon, the Babylonian exile, hoping for a short stay. But Ezekiel is declaring that their capital, Jerusalem, back in Judea, has fallen and the nation is no more. So if they were trying to find comfort in being part of a nation, the nation of, uh, of Israel in Judea, that's gone. It's wiped out. The nation is no more. So what pertains to the nation doesn't pertain to the individuals anymore. So as they were seeking to place the blame for their exile on the missteps of the kings, and the nation of Israel, Ezekiel is at a tipping point in saying, wait a minute, God is no longer interacting with us, God the nation, but Yahweh is in a position to interact with us individually, as an individual person, not as a nation. So this is a vastly different teaching than they may have been used to. In fact, this calls for a new principle of morality, moving away from corporate responsibility towards one of individual responsibility. So you can see how this would be a difficult teaching to swallow. They were thinking they were victims of poor leadership and their country failing them. It wasn't their fault individually. But Ezekiel said, yes, it is your fault because individuals choose to follow Yahweh or not. There's no longer any temple sacrifice. That's gone. But we have to deal conscience to God individually rather than putting all the responsibility on the priestly class or the king or the nation. It's a different concept. Here are some of the bizarre images. This strange beast with four heads and the the famous gyroscope of God, the wheel in the middle of the wheel. Uh, many other images in the book of Ezekiel that challenge us. And you have a field day reading them and, and uh, engaging in speculation about what they might mean. Here is uh, 
the Christian take on Ezekiel, the four beasts have become, in the New Testament parlance, the four New Testament evangelists. There's a, a lion, which some say is the symbol for Matthew, the lion out of Judah. There's a sacrificial animal there, which some say is Luke. There's a human, which some say is Mark, and there's an eagle, which some say is John. So these are the four dynamos that drive the New Testament gospel, just as those four, that four-headed beast drove God around in Ezekiel's visions. So let's read uh, what the scripture says here in Ezekiel 33, verses 9, 7 through 9 say, So you mortal, I have made a sentinel for the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, you shall give them warning for me. If I say to the wicked, O oh, wicked ones, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked to turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but their blood I will require at your hand. But if you warn the wicked to turn from their ways, and they do not turn from their ways, the wicked shall die in their iniquity, but you will have saved your life. Mm. So, the Hebrew text here, if we could read it, this text calls him mortal, or it's translated mortal. This is uh, an instance of the word for Adam, or son of man, or descendant of Adam which is translated mortal. And that is the term that's used throughout uh, this portion of Ezekiel when God on high is ad addressing uh, Ezekiel the human, the mortal, son of man. Ezekiel is dubbed a watchman among the exiles. Not to proclaim judgment, but to give warning. If God puts a message to the wicked that they are turn, to turn from their ways, this is going to be Ezekiel's new job. Since he's no longer ha having any priestly duties, he's warning the exiles to, to repent. He's a watchman looking out on their behalf, looking to God to share the message that God is providing. To speak to the wicked, to warn of danger, and to call them to repentance. It says, if Ezekiel fails to warn, their deaths would be on his hands. Wow, that's quite a responsibility. At least he's taking this seriously. He's, he's thinking, uh, you know, I'm just an innocent bystander. No, he is involved almost to the death. If he doesn't fulfill the calling of God, then their deaths will be attributable to Ezekiel. But if Ezekiel is faithful in delivering the warning, then his life, his own life, will be spared. He will not be charged with, with their death. Seems like a fair deal, but it, it, it requires Ezekiel to be an active participant and not a casual bystander in these events. Here's another Hebrew word that I'm introducing today. Adam, Adam. And it means Adam, man, mankind, humankind, also a proper name. That is what's in the Hebrew text uh, that we are looking at today. When he calls him mortal, he's calling him Adam or son of Adam or Son of man. Son of man is the same thing as saying son of Adam, which is the same thing as saying mortal. And uh, in our Baptist theology, we 
we have put special significance on the designation son of man. Some of the uh, commentators that I read that take a more uh, uh, general approach to this uh, translate it as son of Adam instead of son of man and, and do not place any special significance on that title. It, it means something different to us Christians because Jesus called himself son of man. And there are other shades of meaning for what son of Adam or son of man might mean. And uh, I'll say more about that in a bit. In fact, here is a, in the Hebrew scriptures, the title son of man or son of Adam is used in three different ways. It's one way to speak about humans as insignificant creatures in the presence of God, such as in our text today from Ezekiel, but also in Job and, and other references. It says, son of Adam. It's a way, a roundabout way, of talking about mortals compared to God. In the Psalms and some other uh, portions of Scripture, humans have a more exalted position as next to God in the order of creation. They're still not divine, we are still mortal, but we're not insignificant. So, son of Adam or son of man can be used as talking about uh, uh, humans in the order of creation not being divine. But also in the book of Daniel, Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, it says that the Son of Man will appear at the end times as an apocalyptic figure, bringing with it destruction or judgment. So when, when we see Son of Man in the Hebrew Scriptures, it could refer to any of these. The New Testament use of the phrase is mostly an adaptation from Daniel as an apocalyptic figure. And the New Testament understanding of Son of Man is, is suppressing or losing much of its original Hebrew imagery. And a lot of Baptist theology or Protestant theology talks about Jesus as the Son of Man who's coming at the end time. So in some way, Jesus is this apocalyptic figure or Son of Man or Son of Adam. So all these are complex, interesting uh, shades of meaning for what it, we're introduced here in Ezekiel, but it's not uh, uh, central to, to uh, our lesson. What is central is God has called Ezekiel to become Israel's watchman. And when it says that he will save his life, life in this passage literally means soul. He will save his soul. But this is not soul in the Greek sense of something separate from the body. You know, the New Testament and, and in Greek philosophy and theology, soul is separate from the body or can be distinguished. But in the Hebrew uh, metaphysics, soul and body are a unified uh, a unit. They're, they're not divisible. The Hebrew sense of soul and body is a living unity. You don't take them apart, but they're the same thing. So when it says you will save your soul, it doesn't mean your body's going to go away and your soul survive, but your whole living entity is going to survive. Ezekiel's theology is rather simple in, in one regard, in that sin shortens life and righteousness brings longevity. That's a general truth, uh, but subject to exceptions. You know, we, we wouldn't press this too far. Uh, generally speaking, I mean, you can see the, the truth of this. If you're not engaging in risky activities, not stealing from other people, not putting other people down, not angering other people, uh, your life is not going to be threatened much by others seeking revenge on you. So, in some sense, you, your life may be extended. 
a righteous ethic of living keeps you away from problems that can bring you down. You know, uh, history is, is replete, especially modern history, with people done in by drugs, alcohol abuse, other things, uh, a variety lifestyle. So it's a general truth that if you don't engage in that, your life is going to be blessed and uh, you'll, you'll enjoy longevity. Of course, that's not exactly true for every situation. And even uh, the Hebrews uh, had to remind themselves of that with the book of Job, who did nothing wrong yet suffered a great deal. But there's another powerful biblical truth in this when, when God tells Ezekiel, if you warn, do what I tell you, then you're not responsible for the results. If you, if you follow my advice, share the word, but they don't abide by it, that's their choice. They're going to suffer the consequences, not you. So I get from this wonderful truth that we mortals are responsible only for the process of religion, not for the results. So we do what we can to share the word and if others partake of it and are blessed, so be it. Good for them. But if they do not abide by the truth that we share, the responsibility doesn't fall upon us. The blessings, neither the blessing nor the responsibility for another's relationship with God falls on us mortals. And I think that's good. Here's Ezekiel, God's watchman. You know, back in these ancient times, a watchman in the tower like that would, they would, uh, they were up high and they could see the approach of messengers or storms or armies and they could share the word be before uh, it would become generally known. So that is a, a good image for what Ezekiel is doing, taking God's word and, and, and warning of the coming judgment hoping that they will turn and return from it. So let's read, let's read on. God's real desire. This is quite interesting. Now you, son of man, son of Adam, mortal, say to the house of Israel, thus you have said, our transgressions and our sins weigh upon us and we waste away because of them. How can we live? Say to them, as I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their ways and live. Turn back. Turn back from your evil ways. For why will you die, O house of Israel? And you, mortal, son of Adam, son of man, say to your people, the righteousness of the righteous shall not save them when they transgress. And as for the wickedness of the wicked, it shall not make them stumble when they turn from their wickedness. But the righteous shall not be able to live by their righteousness when they sin. What a wonderful passage this is. Makes perfect sense to me. And I can see why the hearers would think this is unfair. We should not read into these verses the New Testament concept of grace or abundant mercy. That's, that's yet yet to come in. This is a straightforward transaction between uh, individuals and God. It's a straightforward and legal assertion of divine justice. What is new here is movement from a concept of corporate guilt to a concept of individual guilt. 
They say, how can they live in view of the sin of the nation? That's what they're referring to. They say, well, I'm innocent. It's our, our leaders and our nation have fallen away and, and caused this, this, these problems to come my way. But there's only one answer for that, and that's in verse 11. That is to repent and turn back as an individual. It's a mistake to think that we have a reservoir of past virtues that can drown out the effects of new sin in our life. See, I mean, they were experiencing it of old, but we experience it in the modern day. We think, yeah, I've done a lot of good things in life, maybe enough that it can overcome my need for repentance. If I create, uh, engage in any new sin, maybe I've already made up for that by the past virtues. But no, Ezekiel says, only repentance and turning away from w wicked ways will secure life or will bring, bring blessing. This repentance will allow individuals to live, thus nullifying previous offenses. So if they've been wicked in ways past, God says if they will repent and return, then they will live. It will negate the effects of their past sin. And it says that Yahweh, God rejoices at the repentance of the wicked, not at their punishment. So, you can look at these valley of dry bones as perhaps that's symbolic of uh, the fallen nation and wickedness. But in Ezekiel's vision, these dry bones come together at some miraculous point and live again. These dry bones come to life or they are magically assembled and get up to walk around and live or made whole again. So these are powerful truths that speak to God's judgment and justice. Verses 17 to 20. Yet your people say, the way of the Lord is not just. When it is their own way, that is not just. When the righteous turn from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. And when the wicked turn from their wickedness and do what is lawful and right, they shall live by it. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not just. O house of Israel, I will judge all of you according to your ways. So, the justice of Yahweh condemns the righteous when they sin and forgives the sinful when they repent. The people object to this rigid legalism as unjust because both the sins of the wicked and the good of the righteous are equally negated. They see themselves as righteous and good and they don't like it that that's, they get no credit for that. Maybe they got some credit for it back when they were uh, dealing with Yahweh as a nation but in the current situation, they're dealing with Yahweh as an individual and not as a nation. So they say, well, there's no difference between what I've done in the past is good and what the wicked are doing now. Because if we, if we repent, then both are, if, if the wicked repent, then they, have a blessed status, which we don't have if we don't repent. The people want to continue to blame their misfortunes on the sins of the nation. But nation in a corporate sense no longer exists. They're defeated. The capital of Jerusalem has fallen. They are defeated and in exile. There has to be a new way 
to interact with God. Ezekiel is saying that under exile, God is dealing with individuals, not a corporate nation. The people want to blame their situation on corporate guilt and overlook their individual attitudes and behaviors. But Ezekiel is declaring God's justice as an individual matter. And this is hard to accept. Yeah, it's hard for us to accept that our own sin separates us from God. Because we think we're pretty good sometimes. We think maybe we have a reservoir of past virtue that will get us past God's justice. But it just doesn't work that way. Thank goodness we are living in the Christian dispensation. And so the idea of God's justice as presented by Ezekiel has been modified quite a bit by the Christian uh, virtue of our profession of faith and uh, accepting the grace that Jesus has provided us, which provides a great bridge from this very stern, rigid sense of judgment and justice that's being proclaimed by Ezekiel. But the central truth in this, as in the lesson last week, is that we all must turn return and repent continually for the sin in our life. So what are the issues for us today? Well, God is fair. Each person chooses whether to repent and do good or not. There is a general rule that those who seek to follow God live long and prosper, though there are exceptions, such as Job and maybe you. I've known wonderfully uh, wonderful people God-fearing people who through no fault of their own have suffered uh, in this life so it, it's not a 100% uh, rule or law because their individual situations can uh, can arise that that go against it but Generally speaking, if you seek to do the right thing, you'll be in a better situation and relationship with God than if you're living in wickedness. These aspects of Old Testament legalism as presented in Ezekiel have been wonderfully amended by the New Testament doctrine of grace. You know, we don't deserve the forgiveness that we accept. However, I believe that the word from Ezekiel still applies to us Christians in that we must turn from our wicked ways and repent if we are to be if we are to continue to live in Christian blessing even Christians face the need to repent wow remember that God's deliverance is eternal some of it is in the here and now some of it is in the hereafter. So thank you for joining me today. Remember not to take me too seriously. There are lots of ways to interpret scripture. I've given you what I think are uh, uh, a reasonable layperson's understanding of, uh, of the scripture and how it fits into uh, Protestant theology at least. Please remember our prayer concerns. We know many people that are hurting physically, spiritually, uh, emotionally and other ways. Uh, connect with the Sunday School class so that you can discuss uh, these concepts and I hope to see you next week for the third lesson in this unit. As always, we couldn't do this without Daryl's wonderful direction, uh, his uh, engineering and uh, production. Thank you so much, Daryl. So until next week, we'll say goodbye.